Yeah. <laughs> I was on mute. There we go. Hopefully you can hear me now. So uh, perfect. Welcome to this Sunday session. Um, yeah, I was wondering why I wasn't really getting any replies. It was because it was muted. Makes sense. Um, yeah, how is everybody doing uh, today? Where where are you guys joining from? And what have you been up to this weekend? <clears throat> Perfect. Thanks. Um, yeah, you can access these. These are on YouTube for uh, forever. So you can all the like past recordings, you can access all of them on the Snap Revise YouTube channel. And Laura, you're revising for mocks. Yeah, you're probably not the only one in the same in or with that sort of plan. I think there's a lot of mocks coming up in the next couple of weeks for different schools. Ozara, yeah, in the same boat. Sabah joining from Pakistan. Nice. And Verdan from India. Very cool. Also revising Texas. Nice. Must be, is it quite early in the morning then? No, I guess it's like morning time, but not early. Um, nice. AS, yes, you've got January, January mocks. Yeah, yeah. Quite, quite a lot of the GTs I'm working with at the moment, they've all got their mocks next week. So they're quite busy. So yeah, certainly don't feel like you're the only one who's been stuck in revising all, all weekend. Um, anyway, yeah, I think let's, let's make a start. So I'll share my screen. And yeah, hopefully <clears throat> you guys are now looking at a PowerPoint. <coughs> so the aim for today is to go through, it's an AS topic. We're going to look at species, we're going to look at classification and we're going to look at taxonomy. So, uh, yeah, kind of like an essential part of the, the course. It's maybe not the most exciting part. There's actually kind of just a lot of definitions you need to learn, but um, it's relatively straightforward. So, yeah, I'm hoping we can get through all of it in this session. We've got one hour um, now. So, before we get started, I guess a little bit about me. I'm the head of biology at SnapRevise, uh, and I've been teaching and tutoring biology for the last few years. Um, and a little bit about SnapRevise. So we offer these Sunday YouTube sessions as a sort of taster of what we run on our website. So if you like the, the classes and you want to do more, because we only do one per month on YouTube, but on our website, we do like five sessions a week. So if you if you want to do more, then um, yeah, hopefully you sign up and we're actually offering a discount for today. So that's 25% off the courses with this code, New Year 2022. So I'll remind you about the, the code again at the end. Um, but yeah, if you like, if you like it and you want to test it out, then you can get a little, a little discount. Um, cool. So those of you who've done these before, you'll recognize this uh, pyramid. We always start our uh, classes with a bit of revision of the topics we've done recently. So they're usually sort of recapping some of the crucial knowledge that you need in order to um, sort of engage with this lesson. So yeah we'll go through, but some of the questions might not directly relate to what we're doing today. But that's just, well, just let me know in case you're wondering why we're doing these sort of different things. Yeah, just keep it like recap, basically, keeping everything um, everything fresh. So yeah, if you've done one of these before, you'll know already, but if it's your first time, uh, really encourage you guys to engage with the, um, the questions. So I'm gonna ask questions for everybody. And yeah, if you if you want, feel free to type an answer, and then I can look at um, yeah, I can look at your results. It's lagging a little bit. Hmm. 
Let me just check. Because I just had my girlfriend hoovering, and I'm just wondering if she's unplugged the booster. Let me just check one second. No, it all looks like it should be, it should be working. So hopefully, I don't know why it's, um, it's slow, but, oh, it's fine for some of you. Okay. Yeah. Maybe just change the, the YouTube resolution then, if that, if that will help. Um, anyway, yeah. So yeah, I encourage you to engage with these, uh, questions. So first question is what is natural Selection. So this is actually quite a long answer. Um, so you normally do this for like a four or five mark question, but basically like trying to summarize it as uh, concisely as you can. So we'll, we'll probably put a couple of bullet points for this. Okay, nice. It's all, it's all working. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So survival of the fittest is a sort of common way we use to describe natural selection. That's sort of, even if, if, if you haven't studied biology, you'll have probably heard of survival of the fittest. Uh, and that's kind of the, the key idea. So we're going to put a few more biology keywords in. So we would say something like a change in allele frequency. Over time. Um, yeah, some nice answers coming in there from Sophie, Rylan, and Laura. Um, yeah, so what actually drives evolution by natural selection? We've sort of said survival of the fittest, which kind of makes sense. But what would be good is to add. Um, driven by selection pressures. Um, and then like best adapted survive plus reproduce more. Therefore more offspring, more likely to pass on those favorable alleles. And over time, there's a, a general shift in the, the population. Exactly. And actually, yeah, we probably should mention random mutation. Because this is all, um, <coughs> all the changes are, are formed from mutations. So, and this whole process is obviously quite slow. So next one, what is stabilizing selection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, favoring the intermediate or favoring the average or the sort of mean phenotypes. Average phenotype is favored. So can anyone think of an example for this? Yeah, it's different to directional selection, which would favor either um, sort of edge of the, um, the sort of range. Yeah, and you get, exactly, you get the bell-shaped curve. Um, 
today is not physics no this is just this is biology today yeah wingspan would be a good one baby birth weight would be another good example uh like also head size um in a baby so yeah not it's not like extreme as in or maybe like some other uses of the word extreme but it's basically not at either end of the range so say there's there's a range of different um, birth weights in, in babies. Some are going to be very small. Some are going to be very big. But actually, the majority are sort of in the average. The, the average, the middle, sort of medium weight babies are favored. Very small, very big babies are actually disadvantaged. They're, they're, they're worse because um, the, if the baby's too big, there's a risk that the mother will be sort of harmed during birth. If the baby's too small, then often they're not fully developed enough and they, they tend not to survive as well outside of the, the womb. So the, the sort of average size is better. So stabilizing selection drives things towards the, the sort of medium midpoint, whereas directional selection is when something at either extreme is favored. So if very big babies are like better over time, there's going to be more of them that survive and therefore pass on these, these um, genes for larger babies. But probably shouldn't use that as an example because that's not really what happens generally. So something for directional selection, you could say something like um, fur length. So if there's a change in the, the climate and suddenly it gets colder, there's going to be um, a push towards um, individuals with longer fur, which helps keep them warm, saves energy. Um, yeah, so there's three types of selection, stabilizing, disruptive, and directional. I think, well, everybody has to know about stabilizing and directional. I think not everybody actually talks about disruptive. So disruptive is where you um, favor yeah, exactly. There's two peaks when you draw it on a graph. So you favor individuals at either extreme. So with the, um, maybe with the fur as an example, you can either have like very short fur and very, or very long fur, but actually there's not many in, the, in between with the sort of middle length fur. So if you have disruptive selection over a long time, then this leads to speciation is what we're getting at here so you actually end up with two different oops um no two different populations um with different characteristics so one example of this is squirrels we've got tree squirrels and we've got ground squirrels <laughs> They're now totally different species, but they would have come from and they would have shared a common ancestor at some point. And that common ancestor diverged into these two species due to disruptive selection. So some of the squirrels, the early sort of squirrels, they maybe had longer tails <coughs> that made them very agile and they could run around in the trees and they could avoid predators very well in the trees. So they sort of ended up spending most of their time in the trees and they were successful. There was also squirrels with very short tails, which were quick on the ground. So again, they could, they could avoid predators quite well on living on the ground. Um, any squirrels that had sort of medium tails, they were neither particularly quick on the ground or particularly agile in the trees. Um, therefore, they were less likely to survive. So the ones with the sort of average phenotype was, was they were not favored. So um, yeah, over many, many years, you get this population of ground squirrels and you get this population of tree squirrels and they're eventually completely separate species. Once the number of <coughs> um, allele changes have added up over many generations, they can eventually no longer become, uh, can no longer interbreed and therefore are different species. It should be, OCR should do stabilizing and disruptive. If you are in just in AS, you might not have covered them yet, though. Um, 
the lobster fact yeah there's also um that's quite quite an interesting one there's also cuttlefish where um which are like these sort of octopus slash squid type things that live in the ocean um if you're a male cuttlefish you've got two options if you're big you will fight uh other males to try and mate with females or if you're small they impersonate females to sort of get close to the to the females and they will try and mate with them while they're sort of in in disguise in i guess almost like yeah sort of well yeah disguising so they can get close and sneak past the the bigger males um which is quite quite interesting um cool so and then this is not directly related but it's just a bit of revision so what is the role of rna polymerase it actually has two jobs but only one is one is more important than the other yeah exactly proper catfishing so if you can only think of one thing for this that's as long as it's the yeah there's two possible things but one is probably more important to to say than the other <clears throat> um it yeah cut open dna or unzip dna is true and that's the second one which is you probably don't necessarily need to say it but it can be good to mention so when we say like cuts the dna or zips the dna what we should say is like breaks breaks hydrogen bonds between strands um so that for, that causes the the strands to separate um then the other one so anybody said yeah to do with like joining rna nucleotides together exactly so forms phosphodiester bonds so it's worth mentioning the actual name of these bonds um kind of run out of space try and squeeze it in here between rna nucleotides and that gives rise that's really messy isn't it if i move rub out these lines a bit better <coughs> that gives rise to the um the sort of messenger rna strand um yeah uh sophie common misconception and actually a few of you a few of you have also mentioned this dna helicase breaks the hydrogen bonds in dna replication but there's actually no dna helicase in protein synthesis so for transcription you don't there's no helicase it's actually rna polymerase that does both jobs it it does the phosphodiester bonds and also the separating the strands breaking the hydrogen bonds in dna replication you're right though in dna replication we have dna helicase breaking the hydrogen bonds and then dna polymerase is joining the phosphodiester bonds between the two strands so uh, sorry between the new the nucleotides in the newly forming strand um so yeah you probably wouldn't they tend not to be too picky on this in the mark scheme so even though it's actually incorrect you probably wouldn't get marked down for mentioning helicase but it's actually not it doesn't play a role in um in transcription <clears throat> so yeah if you just said this one that's probably fine i think you can get away with not mentioning the hydrogen bonds but it does do that so okay next describe the structure of the golgi apparatus The RNA doesn't replicate. No, you can make lots of copies from the same gene. But um, yeah, the, the Golgi doesn't really have much to do <coughs> with um, RNA. Yeah, so the, oh, we're just looking at the structure, but function. 
is like um, packaging plus modification. of proteins and various other various other things um but yeah yeah nice janelle i like that membranous stacks called systony exactly of um uh, what should we say layers of membrane Um, called systemy, and it is surrounded by vesicles. So <clears throat> the Golgi is a little bit like sort of the Amazon fulfillment center, where they where they send out all the packages to the different places. They all get sort of sorted and packaged into the delivery vans from this central warehouse. It's a bit like what the, the Golgi does. It packages all the proteins that are gonna be exported or sent around the cell into vesicles, modifies them a little bit, some of them. And then the vesicles actually get dragged around the cell via the cytoskeleton. And some specs, you talk about the motor proteins in A2, which is actually what drags them around. but. We won't go into that now because, um, yeah, it's not it's not actually in the AS spec. <coughs> Proteins tend not to enter by diffusion. They tend to actually they tend to be moved more with vesicles, because diffusion we can't really control where they're going. Whereas the vesicles, they can be dragged to, like exactly where they need to go. Um, cool. Then just going to skip this question, but I'm sure you guys know a lot about classification already. So we're just going to recap some of those things today. So yeah, we'll look at species, we'll look at taxonomic levels, and then we'll look at how we classify organisms. So first question, well, not, sorry, not first question. Um, sort of first question of the, the specific topic, I guess then. How would you define species? So there's a little bit of variation <clears throat> between the specs here with how they define it, but hopefully you guys have all got something reasonably similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the keywords here. Oh, Abdullah, you said that can breed. Better if you say interbreed. It's only a subtle different difference, but um, it, yeah, I would I would go for that word instead. So um, we'd say something like group of organisms that can interbreed. and produce fertile offspring. So the key, the sort of key bits there, interbreed and fertile offspring. So <laughs> just being able to interbreed um, isn't enough. The offspring needs to be fertile. Closely related species can sometimes actually interbreed and produce offspring, but those offspring are not fertile. So we call that offspring a hybrid. Um, yeah, and there's a few examples, like a, a mule is a cross between a donkey and a horse, like a liger is a cross between a lion and a tiger. Um, a wolfin is a cross between a false killer whale and a, a, a dolphin, and all of these <coughs> These hybrids, they, they can live and they can be quite healthy, but they are infertile. They actually can't have children of their own. So yeah, if you want a mule, you can't cross two mules together. You need to go back to the horse and the donkey because mules are all infertile. So, okay, nice. And then 
We use something called the binomial system. This was invented several hundred years ago by a Swedish, I think he was a botanist um, mostly, but he was interested in classification in general, uh, called Carl Linnaeus. He came up with this binomial system where we, we use two Latin names. Yeah, exactly. So we use the genus first and then the species name. Genus name followed by species name. So yeah, someone's put an example there. Um, Homo sapiens, humans. So Homo is the genus um, for uh, sort of um, hominids, sort of um, upright walking um, human-like animals. And then sapiens is our particular species name. And that means like wise. So our, ours is like wise man is what Homo sapiens technically means in, um, yeah, in Latin. The, yeah, and we use Latin. Well, we could have picked a different language, but Latin was more popular uh, with scientists back in, back in the day. So we use Latin and it's, but it's good to have it all in the same language. It sort of allows for comparison between different countries. So if you're publishing a paper in French and someone wants to read it in German, say, if you have the, the actual binomial name, it's going to be the same word for the, the animal. So it helps to sort of, yeah, to help scientists around the world collaborate and talk about the, the same thing. Um, yeah, a couple of things like you're pointing out. So you need to do a capital letter for the genus name. You have to do a lowercase letter for the species name, and it should be in italics. So you can either, if you're typing it, you just put it in italics. But if you're writing it, you can't really write in italics. Well, because some people's handwriting kind of looks like it's in italics anyway, and it's just not that clear. So when we, when we handwrite it, we usually underline it to show that it's in italics. That's the correct way to, to do it. Um, yeah, and we're, we don't know how many species there are. Estimates, estimates range from roughly 10 to 100 million. We found just under 2 million at the moment. But yeah, we're finding new species every day. So yeah, we really don't know how many are actually out there. And unfortunately, we're, we're losing species every day as well. So we'll actually never know how many species we had say like this sort of time because they're going extinct um, faster than we can even identify them. So we're not even fully aware of how much um, biodiversity is, is being lost. So this next bit, this is actually just AQA that needs to talk about this. So I mean, it's kind of relevant to other ones, but it's only specifically named in the AQA spec. So just a little bit on courtship behavior. So courtship behavior is um, it's quite an interesting bit of biology to study because there are lots of weird sort of courtship rituals between different, different animals. Lots of animals like some birds have developed very elaborate courtship rituals. You might have seen some of the birds of paradise in a sort of David Attenborough documentary where they have got crazy feathers and they do funny dances to attract um, a mate. And there's lots of weird and interesting behaviors or like a like a peacock uh, with its long tail this is actually don't know if you guys have seen a video of this this is called a peacock spider kind of for obvious reasons it's got this big colorful tail just like a peacock and um, yeah I'd recommend checking out on YouTube just the search peacock spider mating dance and they kind of waggle this tail in a quite funny way and I don't, I, I kind of I don't I don't know. I really don't like spiders that much, but these ones actually, these ones are quite cute as spiders go. They're only a few millimeters um, big. Anyway, yeah, different animals have courtship behavior to help them identify a potential mate. To identify.
It helps to check if the uh, mate is receptive. Um, so what can we say there? Ensure. And actually, we use courtship behavior to classify species. So it can be used to classify. <coughs> um, <coughs> yeah, I think we'll just, we'll just do that. So yeah, increases the chance of successful mating, exactly. Uh, yeah, rituals can play a roles in um, pair bonding. Definitely, some some animals uh, will mate for life. Um, so again, quite a lot of birds do this, and the, the sort of mating rituals help to um, sort of foster those um, those bonds. So, how are we feeling with that so far? Hopefully, all good. And then we're going to do some past paper questions now. Yeah, humans, we probably shouldn't, a lot of the stuff in biology, you can, or you can refer a lot of it back to humans, but obviously we are a little bit different to other, other animals. Um, yeah, well, we're like certainly more, self-aware than any other um, animal on the planet. So yeah, we'll just do these two questions. The first one's relatively straightforward, just a, um, a multiple choice. And then we've got this question on the other page, which is a little bit more maths heavy. So we'll look at that in a second. So this is the European badger, Milas Milas, which is a member of the family muster daily this is like all sorts of um badgers stoats weasels like the honey badger is a quite a famous example um <coughs> they all are in this family this is the uh sorry and then the american badger belongs to a different genus within the same family which of these is the correct binomial name for the american badger So you can just give me the letter and if you want, maybe like a quick explanation as to why, how you managed to get to that answer. So a couple of you guys going for A, got someone voting for C. It's actually not either of those two. D because it's capitalized. Yeah. So we can actually eliminate two straight away because two of them aren't actually the right form. So binomial naming, you need to have a capital letter to begin and a whole thing needs to be in italics. So they're all in italics, that's fine. But this one doesn't have a capital letter at the beginning. So actually, even without <coughs> reading the question, we can say these are definitely wrong because that's not binomial naming. So it can't be B or C. It's between A and D. So we've said it belongs to a different genus within the same family. So as its genus name, then species, it can't be Mila's. That's the same genus. You said it was a different genus, therefore it can't be A, it must be D. Um, so this is a different genus. We don't, you're not expected to know what the genus for an American badger is, but you just have to recognize that it's different. It's not Mila's. So that's the only one that it could possibly be. So yeah, D. Hope that makes sense. Then we've got, this one's quite an interesting question. It's a bit, bit difficult, I would say. So we've got some data on courtship and mating in fruit flies. 
So this, um, <clears throat> the diagram show the courtship sequence um, from males from two closely related species of fruit fly. So species A, species B. And the numbers show the probability of one courtship element following on from another. So <coughs> it's a little bit hard to interpret, but it's basically what the males tend to do in certain situations. So they seem to follow like a, a set routine, but sometimes they almost like abort or they skip a few, a few steps. So I'll try and like explain what's going on. Then we'll look at the question. So say on this first one, the male orientates towards the female 90% <clears throat> of the time. It will then um, scissor its wings, whatever that means, maybe like flaps them a little bit, but 10% of the time, it will vibrate its wings. That's how you interpret this graph. And then, so this one's oriented to the female. 90% of the time, it will go to this one. And then from this position, 60% uh, of the time, it will go on to vibrate its wings. 40% of the time, it will go back to that first stage. From vibrate wings, three quarters, 75% go on to lick the female and 25% go back to the original orientating towards the female and so on. So hopefully you can kind of make sense of how this diagram works. And we'll look at the question now. So once a male of species A has orientated to the female, what is the probability that he will perform each courtship element only once and then attempt to mate? And we want to show you're working for two marks. <clears throat> As is always the case with biology, I think it's always the case anyway, it's certainly most often the case. If you get full marks, you don't actually need to put the working. The marks, as long as you've got it correct, you will always get full marks. The putting the working is, um, is just there in case you get like one of the steps wrong and you might get one of the marks. You'll get some credit for your working if you, um, yeah, if you put it down. So it is always worth doing. So webcam is covering some of the question. Hopefully you can see some of it or what I could do maybe is like turn the webcam off for us. Oh no, that was a mistake. Screen went black. I could maybe turn the webcam off for, um, yeah, there you go. It's off for like 10 seconds now. So you can just quickly read if you wanted to read that bit of the question. So I'll put it back on now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what's the chance of the male doing each of these things once before mating with the female, once it's orientated towards the female? Yeah, nice, Conrad. The answer is 0.27 or 27%. Um, so there's a 27% chance it does each thing once before passing through. And how do you actually work that out? So you just multiply all the numbers together. So we start here and we want to end here only performing each action once. So we have to keep working through. So <clears throat> from this position, 90% of the time, they're going to move to this stage. So 0.9, and we just times that as we go down. So 0.9 times from here, 60% will keep going forward. 40% will go back. We don't, we're not worried about the ones that go back. So 60% of this. So we times it by 0.6 because 90% have gone here. And of that 90%, 60% will carry on to vibrate the wings. Of that 
60% of that 90%, only 75% of them will go on. So we now times it by 0.75. And then of those, 0.67 will go on to, to this one times 0.67. And then times that by, oh no, then attempt to mate. That's the stage we were trying to get to. So that should give you your answer of 0.27. <clears throat> so yeah, it's a little tricky to, to have understood what you had to do. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's a hard, a hard question. Um, but that's the idea. Is everyone happy with what this number is and how, how we got to it? Yeah, you can't have a probability greater than one, exactly. Um, so yeah, actually, I guess that, that would have been a little bit of a clue, Sophie, maybe. Um, a 3.42 probability is basically impossible. It's between zero and one. One being everybody does this, zero being nobody does this. 0 0.5, meaning half of them do this, half of them don't. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, hopefully that's making sense. If you guys have got any questions on that, let me know. And it, like I said, it is a hard, a hard question. Otherwise we can move on to the next one. Why do we not multiply by 0 0.5? Good question, because we only have to go to the then attempt to mate. So we're only looking at them getting to here. The ones that attempt to mate, only half of them actually successfully mate, but we're not interested in that. We only needed to get to here. That's what the question was asking. So how many go from here to here without going back? Um, so hopefully that makes, yeah, that makes sense. We, the, the question wasn't, basically wasn't asking. If the question was how many, after they've orientated towards the female, how many successfully actually mate, this number would be half. We would times it by 0 0.5, and the actual answer would be um, half of this, so 0.135. Um, but it wasn't asking for that. It was asking just to get to here. Um, cool. So suggest how the courtship sequences provide evidence to support the claim that the two species are closely related. So we're looking between species A and species B here. What on that would make you think that they might be closely related? Yeah, you're on the right sort of lines there. So yeah, probably if you had a species A and a species B, like a male from species A, if they met a, a female from species B, they might not successfully mate because they have a slightly different way of, way of doing it. But the, um, so yeah, in this case, the species B, when they orientate towards the female, only 4% will um, scissor their wings. And that actually doesn't lead anywhere else. They always go back to that. So this seems kind of like a pointless step uh, for species B. Uh, majority go straight to vibrating their wings. And that seems to be the um, sort of steps you need to go through in order to, to trigger um, mating. So although there are differences, the fact that they have very similar sort of um, patterns of um, sort of courtship rituals. So they orientate towards the female, they like vibrate their wings, lick the female, and then attempt to mate. The numbers are different, but the actual um, sort of sequence or actions is similar. Similar actions, 
uh, or you could just say similar sequence of rituals between the two. Not the same, but actually kind of similar. So yeah, we would probably guess from this, or we would hypothesize that they are probably reasonably closely related. They have a common ancestor uh, not too far, not too uh, long ago. Cool. So let's look at classification, taxonomy, and phylogeny a little bit more. So classification just means organizing things into groups. So um, yeah, the, the way we classify um, organisms in uh, biology, it, well, the way we classify the different species is through a process known as taxonomy. So what this is, is we, we organize them into a hierarchy. A hierarchy is where you've got groups within groups. So you'll be familiar with this. If you've ever saved documents on a computer, <clears throat> the way you save documents into folders acts like a hierarchy. So if you click on your like main desktop, like your main folder for your documents, that's the one big folder that's got all the other documents in. That's like your top um, domain. And each time you, you sort of click on one of the folders to open it up, that will give you more options. That's like moving down the hierarchy. So they're all in the top group. As you move down, there's less and less um, individuals or files, if you're looking on a computer, that are in that group. So you could represent that sort of as a diagram with the hierarchy at the top and then lots of smaller folders in the sort of in the in the next ones. And I can't fit it all on there, but that's the idea. Uh, no, this is this is still this is AS. So artificial classification, we don't tend to do for biology, but this is classifying stuff based on um, arbitrary characteristics like size or color or um, maybe like leg length. Um, um, different features. Based, e.g., color, size, um, food source. I suppose the problem with this is <coughs> it's not really that useful. We can we could have a we could group animals by color, but it doesn't really tell us anything about that animal. Um, it doesn't take into account its evolutionary history. So from a biology perspective, it doesn't really have much merit. Hence why we tend not to use artificial classification. That was what they used to use in like some of the very early um, attempts to classify all the um, plants and animals. People didn't really know. Um, well, certainly before Darwin came up with the theory of evolution, people weren't even necessarily aware that animals had evolved. We kind of just thought they were always there and were unchanging. So yeah, grouping things by animals that can fly, animals that can swim, that kind of made more sense. But once we figured out that things can evolve and they change, this didn't really make as much sense. And actually we were more interested in grouping things by their evolutionary history. And that's where phylogeny comes in. Phylogenetic classification is grouping based on evolutionary history. I.e. like if they shared a more recent common ancestor, you they're more closely related, you group them together. If they didn't share a common ancestor for a long time, they're gonna be quite distantly related. Um, so, and we call that a taxonomic hierarchy. Um, 
So you should hopefully all be familiar with this. The, we've managed to get it into how many levels is it actually? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight levels. So we start with, actually, no. Oh, no, this has got the domain in. So we start with domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. There's lots of mnemonics people have to remember the order of this. So whichever one you use um, is fine, as long as you get the order correct. And they've gone through for a red fox, sort of the, the different groups they would be in. So they're eukaryotes, they're animals, they're, they're vertebrates, they have a backbone, they're mammals, they're carnivores, um, the canine family, i.e. the dog family, that's what they're in. And then this genus is specifically for foxes. And then this one, the red fox happens to be it's reasonably common that the, the genus and species name is the same if they're the most like abundant type of that animal. So vulpes is like, it basically just means fox. And because this is like the most common fox in Europe, we just ended up calling it vulpes, vulpes. Exactly the same as this badger being called milas, milas. This basically is the word for badger. Uh, rats are uh, ratus, ratus again because they're like the common, most common ones. But a different species of fox would be called vulpes something else. Um, so yeah, hopefully that is all clear. And yeah, I wanted to get on to some questions. So I guess we've still got time to do this, I think. Um, so yeah, let's look at phylogeny in a little bit more detail. So this is a phylogenetic tree. You'll hopefully have seen one of these before and you have to be able to interpret what they mean. So let's establish some principles. All organisms on earth shared a common ancestor so we're all related at some level all living things on the planet are all related <coughs> um some things obviously are more closely related than others this is all to do with how long ago they diverged from a, a common ancestor so if if two organisms are close on a phylogenetic tree this means that they shared a common ancestor more recently. Um, so for example, on this uh, tree, we've got bony fish, i.e. sharks, sorry, no, cartilaginous fish, i.e. sharks and stingrays, bony fish, which are like all the rest of the fish, amphibians, mammals, Oh, two different types of mammal here, and a reptile and a bird. So from this diagram, which um, which species, oh, sorry, which thing is most closely related to the bird? I.e., they had a most the most recent common ancestor. Yeah, the reptiles. They're on the same sort of, they diverge quite like here, relatively closely. So this is the most closely related. What's the least closely related? I.e. they shared a common ancestor the longest time ago. <clears throat> yeah, nice, the sharks. So cartilaginous fish, these last shared a common ancestor with birds a very long time ago. They actually also shared a common ancestor, last shared it with um, all these other things at the same time. So they diverged relatively early. Birds and reptiles only diverged much later. Mammals coming off um, a bit differently as well. 
So yeah, I think some people have been talking about this uh, or sort of been mentioning some of these ideas. So we, with modern sort of science breakthroughs, we can actually see evolutionary history a lot more easily. Before we looked at like anatomy, behaviors, um, yeah, that was kind of the two big ones, particularly anatomy, but behaviors and um, sort of other things would have factored, factored in. But now with um, improvements in science, we can, we can look at much more detail. So we look at the DNA of different species. And because mutations only arise relatively slowly and they come in, slowly um look at dna if more similar more closely related so you might have heard sort of um facts like we share i can't remember exactly what the percentage is that we share with chimpanzees but our dna is something like 99 percent the same as a chimpanzee it might even be like 99.9 .9 or something like yeah we're we're actually very closely related to chimpanzees we shared a common ancestor very recently um and even something like a fruit fly we're still like 70 percent similar to a fruit fly um even something that's not even an animal like a banana or a fungus we're still i think it's something like 60 percent of our DNA is still the same as these different things. So it's kind of like, this is more proof that we all descended from a common ancestor because we share a lot of our DNA with every other living thing on the planet. Um, the higher the amount, the more closely it's related, the lower the amount, the more uh, distantly it's related. So we look at the DNA or we can look at the proteins. Um, and then the number of amino acids that are different. Um, will indicate whether, um, yeah, whether they're closely related or less closely related. So we often look at a protein called cytochrome C. This is a good one to look at because it's a relatively small protein. Um, so it's quite easy to, to sequence, but it's a very important protein. It plays a role in making ATP. It's part of the electron transport chain. So very important proteins. These are actually tend to mutate quite slowly because, because they're so important. If a mutation stops it working correctly, then that organism cannot survive. So it can only, yeah, most mutations will end up, it's known as like a fatal allele, i.e. the organism can't survive. Therefore, that won't be passed on. So, yeah, um, it's kind of similar because obviously proteins are based on the DNA, but you can either look at the DNA directly or you can look at the proteins that are synthesized from that DNA. And then... Immunological comparisons is, um, yeah, looking at the immune systems and if they have similar antigens, this will be more closely related. Uh, more closely related. Um, bonds of amino acids yeah the primary structure is amino acids joined by peptide bonds and then the um, the other bonding depends on the whether it's in secondary or tertiary structure um, there's different bondings that occur there um, cool so oh 
kind of wanted to, yeah kind of didn't get through quite as much as I was hoping to in that one I wanted to kind of get onto these questions but it's already six o'clock and this this will take a few minutes to go through so I think we won't do them this time um it's always a bit tricky to get through everything on the YouTube sessions. When we normally run them on our website, there are less people in the classes. And it just, I don't really know why it is, but it just tends to go quicker. Um, and we can get these finished within an hour. It's always a bit tricky to do it for on um, a YouTube session. But if you want to screenshot these questions and have a go, by all means, feel free. So that's one of the questions. And that's another one of the questions. Um... So, yeah, I think we'll stop there for today. Um, a couple of things before we uh, finish. Uh, just to remind you guys to set a reminder on YouTube for these sessions so you can join the upcoming sessions. We haven't got a biology one for a little while now, but we've got other subjects. Um, and, yeah, subscribe to the YouTube channel to... Um, to be reminded from these. Then a little bit about our package. So I'll show you the website in a second and talk you through what we, what we offer. But basically, if you enjoyed the class today and you want to do more of these web classes, um, yeah, you can sign up to the, um, the, our SnapRevise courses on the website. As part of this, you get videos that go through all the different topics. These are all organized by specification. So they're specific to your uh, specification. So you just pick your specification. Then the one of the one of the best features, I think, are these smart quizzes. So if you watch a video on a topic, you can then do a quiz to see how well test sort of test yourself and how well you understood it. Um, if you get it right, that's all good. If you get it wrong, however, it will link you back directly to the section of the video that is related to the bit that you got wrong. So it's a really powerful, quick way of diagnosing what you know. And if you don't know it, it will lead you back to that, um, that area so you can revise it. And before you move on, you can make sure that you fully understand it. So really good diagnostic tool. Uh, we've got these sort of condensed revision notes, sort of like a cheat sheet, everything you need to know in as a condensed form as possible. We go through exam questions, um, teaching you how to do, working on your exam technique, basically. This is a crucial part of doing well in biology or any, any exam is your exam technique. So these walkthroughs will explain how you should approach the questions and how you can get full marks. So also handy. Then the final feature we have are uh, extra exam questions. So what you might have noticed is there's actually not that many exam questions in total for your um, for your particular course, for your specification. And what you'll probably find uh, after, particularly by the time you're actually sitting your exams next summer, you've kind of seen all the questions already. So it's not really, you're not really getting the same experience. If you've seen a question before, it's not quite the same as if you're coming at it like a completely new question. So you can kind of, you might not fully remember <coughs> the answers, but it it's usually easier if you've done it once before, you sort of remember some bits of it. So you can't really practice properly on the same questions. So what we've done is made extra questions that you won't have seen before to allow you to get the proper sort of exam practice. And they're quite handily just organized by difficulty. So that's that's an option as well. And yeah, I think, yeah, don't forget. So this is the, the, um, the discount code if you want to get 25% off the course. So new year, 2022. I'll quickly show you the website just because it looks a little bit different looking on the, um, on the actual computer. So it looks like this. These are the courses. You pick your subject. So Let's go, where's biology? Oh, I think because I've already subscribed to biology, I can't do that. Um, 
But yeah, you would pick your exam board and then, oh, okay. I'm not gonna go all the way through this now, but anyway, this is the website, snapprovise.co.uk. Uh, feel free to check it out and try, yeah, one of our, one of our courses and hopefully see you in these web classes um, in the future. So yeah, we do five a week and we also do drop-in sessions where you can request topics that you want to work through. So the web classes, we just go through the, the spec in order. Drop-ins, if there's something you finding difficult, you can just join us, join us for those. Anyway, yeah, it's already quite late. So gonna end there. Thanks very much for joining and hopefully see you in one of these in the future or see you on our website for our like subscription based web classes. Cool, all right, bye guys. Thank you. Have, yeah, enjoy the rest of your Sunday, whatever you're, whatever you're up to. And yeah, good luck. Oh yeah, good luck with mocks. Anybody who is doing a mock next week. Um, sweet, all right, see ya, bye.